the clue is in the in the words talent management. It's about how do we unlock not just the talent of the individual, but the talent of the individual that supports our direction of travel, our purpose and our goals for the year ahead. The question is from Thinking Focus. Hi, I'm Ricky. Hi, I'm Paul. And today the question is, what's a leader's role in talent management? Very opportune question for this time of year because people are starting to think about you know, what do they want from people? What do they want from their employees? What do they want from their team? It's appraisal time, isn't it? So it is, yeah. They're reviewing last year and hoping that they, uh, they set some very clear goals to make that, that review process easier. And then what does that mean for the year ahead? What's, the, what's my development plan look like this year? And I think I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it because so many companies, and I, you have worked for them, I'm sure. I definitely have worked for companies who treat this like an annual ritual. Like, do you know what? We'll just sit in a room for a couple of hours once a year, tell you why you were bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Occasionally good. Yeah, occasionally good. And then send you out to be motivated to go and do the whole thing over and over again. And I think that's where it comes back to where's the leader's role in this? Because if we see it as almost this kind of, and I've done this, this kind of process that I have to kind of get over and done with really quickly because it gets in the way of the real work. Well, yeah, but more importantly, that's reinforced by um, HR chasing you. And HR are not chasing you because they're bothered by what you've written or what you've put into the process. What they're bothered about is you're actually having the conversation. Yes. Um, and, and the problem is that we get caught up in, and I use the we because I've felt like this before, is we get caught up in task, task, task. We need to do the action rather than step back and go, what's the highest value conversation I can have with this individual that is going to set them up for success for the year ahead? And it's a, uh, for me, it's kind of a, a, a misunderstanding of what the role is of a, of a manager to a certain extent, but definitely of a leader. Um which is, you know, a lot of people, I, mean, I was at a coaching call the other day and somebody was like, you know, what's my primary responsibility? And they were like, to get this thing done. Yeah. And you go, I want to reframe that. That's not your primary responsibility. Your primary responsibility is to lead this group of people to get this thing done. You're doing it through them. Because if you're just seeing the world as I have to get this done, well, then they're in your way. And you're going to take on more and more and more. But you're also limited to your own capacity. You can't grow it and do more because you can only do what, what you can cope with. The point of leadership is to grow and develop and build a group of people around you who are bigger than what you could have done sitting in your room on your own. Absolutely. The clue is in the, in, in the words talent management. Yeah. It's about how do we unlock not just the talent of the individual, but the talent with, of the individual that supports our direction of travel, our purpose and our goals for the year ahead. So let's start with going then, what, what actually is talent management? What are we really talking about here? Oh, well, I was hoping you were going to answer that one. Okay. <laughs> I, I, th I think you're talking about three things, really simply. Getting the right people in. Getting the wrong people out. Are you going down the Jim Collins route here? A little bit, but I, I, I think this is a slightly bigger conversation than, than just the Jim Collins on the bus and off the bus. But yeah. I think that's a really nice way of putting it. Have, are you bringing in the right people? Are you getting rid of the wrong people? Are you growing the people that you have? And all three of those are against the parameters of where are we going to be next? Yes. And and I think that's really important that, you know, this is about the future, not today, because you, you know, the talent you have is delivering your results today. Or, or not delivering the results or, today. Or yes, absolutely. That, that just puts the urgency on it. But whatever the result is, it's delivering the result of today, whether that's desired result. Oh, yeah, that's fair. You have got what you've got. Um, what we're really saying is, let's look out 12 months 24 months even 36 months and say what do we need to start thinking about now in order to prepare this group of people for the future in other words have we got the right talent on the bus in order to get us there yeah and this comes back to and we've talked about this in a number of other podcasts um, particularly some of the ones where we've talked about some of the leadership piece 
which is you can't do any of this if you have no idea where you're going. Yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't matter if you're CEO and and you're leading ten thousand people or whether you've got five people and a little team. If you don't know where you're taking it, the rest of it gets really hard. But if you do know where you're going, if you've got a vision for the future, you've got some sort of goal or objective or place you need to be, you understand what the changing expectation on you is, then actually it's quite easy to go, okay, right, I know next year we need to be X or we need to take on more work or we need to, to be working in slightly different ways or different areas. Do I have the skills and expertise to deliver against that or don't I? And and actually that that plays into the Collins stuff a little bit in terms of, he would argue that in getting the right people on the bus, actually what you're looking for is people that are bought into your purpose, not necessarily your objectives and goals. So so the what we're going to do is very much unimportant here because that could change. And, and let's look at, you know, the last few years, it will change. How we go about doing what we do will change. But actually the purpose and our direction of travel what we want to be when we grow up type statements should be consistent yeah and i think that brings in a really interesting sort of piece around talent management that uh, very often people focus on the skills part of talent not the fit or attitude behavioral part of talent and i think in most modern businesses it's got to be the other way around you you almost like hire for attitude recruit for for attitude recruit the right people because they fit with the team they get the vision they get what you're trying to do they get where you're trying to go because those kind of people will grow and develop and learn the skills whereas if you bring in highly skilled people who are fixated on their skills and don't get the vision don't want to grow eventually you are as an organization as a team as a leader you're going to outgrow them yeah because the world is going to change and it's going to be painful managing that process too because yeah. because you you're in a constant battle you're in a constant um trying to satisfy their needs when actually that's not what you need to be doing you need to be going right how do we how do we make this happen and how do we how do we organize ourselves how do we create the the fit as you talked about it that reminds me of of the Steve Jobs comment you're better with a hole than an arsehole yeah, I, I love that comment, because, but it's true, because if you've got the wrong people, and I think of, of the three bits in talent management, the bit most people find the hardest, but probably the most important, is getting the wrong people off the bus, Jim Collins' language. It's, it's like, if you've got the wrong people in your team, that there's two things here. One is, the wrong person in your team, you got, I, th- I always think of a sales team I had once, where I had 10 people, and one of them was clearly the wrong person. I remember him saying to me at one point, the, the biggest bit I don't like about the job is having to meet customers. And you think you're in sales. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and I, I get it. There, there were some whingy customers at the time, but that, that's not the point. It's like, that's the core of the job. But you go, having that one person there isn't them reducing the team from 100% to 90%. It's reducing the team to less than 90%. Uh, yes. Because the, te- the rest of the team isn't just covering for that person. They're not just doing the job because that person isn't that person then has an impact on everybody else's ability to do the job. And and also a distraction for the manager of that team because now yeah. they're not focused on developing and growing the talent of the rest who do want to be here and do want a great job. There's a disproportionate amount of time then spent trying to get this person you know, motivated up for it. Uh, and actually, you know, you're kind of fighting a losing battle if if they're saying that you know, if it weren't for the customers, this would be a great job. Yeah, well, I think that is true for most people in sales who think that, but that's not the point. He didn't like being with customers. But yeah, I get the point. He, he, he was a drain on the management time. So actually, in reality, he was the least productive member of my team and probably at least a third of my management time. So what is it then that makes it really important um, talent management let's look firstly through that lens of a of a company why is what makes it so important uh, it really simply it's future survival you know the reality is in uh, uh, this probably isn't true in every company um yeah if we <laughs> let's go back in time let's go we're a victorian you know entrepreneur you're some victorian you know um, i'm not that old. Rich, rich person with your top hat on and, and i do think you know also top hat podcasting don't need to do that you don't need to dress up that much <laughs> but the, your victorian um 
you know, um, philanthropist with your big factory. For you, it's all about the machine. It's all about, do I have the factory? Do I own the land? Do I have the big machine that makes the widget? And if I own the machine, I'm the man. That's not true for most companies today. Most of the organizations we work with, there is no big singular thing and the people are interchangeable about it. Um, you know, we, used to, we used to describe the thing as an asset, the machine as an asset, and the workers, they sit on the liability side of the balance sheet. Yes. And so you swap them out. Um, whereas now in most organizations, the reality is the liability holds all the knowledge and is all the skill. Um, and the asset is a laptop. And if the laptop broke, you could probably go out and buy another one tomorrow, as we often do, you know? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, so why is this really important? It's the same reason why for the Victorian, it was really important to service the machine and maintain it. Because if you don't, eventually it's going to break and then you're in trouble. Um, so if you're, if you're an organization right now, talent management is machine maintenance for your most important asset, your people. And it's upgrading the machine maintaining the machine it's keeping it going for tomorrow and and that as you said earlier is all about making sure we understand where we want to be tomorrow because otherwise yeah how, where do you even start with the development piece where do you even start looking at the um the growth of an individual in and in what direction are we just kind of hoping that we'll get it right or well oh, and there's a sort of a level i guess of general entropy which is if you don't grow the machine the chances are you're not going to grow the overall wealth of the organization which probably means over time you're going to pay people less which means they're going to leave anyway you know people... yeah and and a person that's not developed is likely to go backwards unless they're smart enough to work out that i can go somewhere else and get this stuff yeah it's a it's a kind of a an organizational death spiral in some ways which Ooh. is once you once you start doing it the consequences of what you're doing create more issues that probably mean you're doing it more and you know eventually over time it's it you know you see that that actually affects everything that you're doing because the good people leave first so i'm kind of thinking then we're saying this is important yeah i, I yeah <laughs> i'll go with that yeah okay so let's flip then let's look at this uh, through the lens of an individual what makes talent management so important to to me as an individual well the reality is there's an entropy argument here which is if you if you stay still if you just try and stay as you are you will slowly become more and more out of touch more and more out of date i've never seen this any more defined than when i worked in it um, and you'd see it with IT people who would be highly skilled. They'd go and train on some unique piece of software or some code or some system. And they'd, for a period in their career, be really highly skilled. And the ones that didn't understand that it was a constant journey would eventually end up in a very high paid position where they're one of a few people left who can deal with this unique product. And then all of a sudden, they're unemployable. Yes. Because that product's gone. And they've got to go right back to the bottom and start again. They don't get choice of projects. They don't get choice of, of, of interesting work. It, and I've, I've seen it happen so many times to so many people. It's soul destroying for them. So as an individual, why is talent management so important? It's, it's you protecting your future. That, that's interesting. Um, I, I remember years ago working with a client who were managing the digital switchover for television. So it was going from the analog um, and, and mast, uh, analog to digital and the mast engineers were literally like that proverbial rocking horse. What's it? Yep. Um, and their value in the marketplace was just skyrocketing. And then of course it tips because it's transferred. Everything's now digitized and, and therefore we're not using the same equipment as we were before. Now they could have, you know, ridden that, that kind of gravy train for a period of time, but if they weren't focused on, so what does that mean in the new digital world for me and what new skills do I need to do? Then they could, you know, like your, your IT example, they could suddenly become irrelevant in the marketplace yeah exactly and and you think well that's just a technical role but i now see exactly the same thing in psychology you know the 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 ideas and the 
concepts and the thing are moving so fast that if I don't stay on top of them, if I'm not constantly evolving and developing myself, at some point I'm going to be talking about stuff that's really old and really dated and been superseded because the world is moving on. You know, <clears throat> the, the world is moving at a faster and faster pace because we're building on the you know, shoulders of giants each time. We're building now on some really great ideas which accelerate the process. There's some straight economics about this. I'm not going to pretend for a second I understand economics, but if you look at it, it's that that skills become scarce. At a period of time, scarcity drives the price up. So if you're a scarce skill as an employee, you can, you know, demand a high price. You can get a big salary. But scarcity also drives innovation. And therefore, you could easily get out innovated and find out that you're not a scarce resource you're an unused unusable not wanted resource yeah because if we can't find the resource let's find a different way of doing it exactly why and, wouldn't you? Uh, uh, well, of course and i think that probably plays into you know why this is important we've talked about but if you don't invest in the talent management of your team you are very much like you said, it's a creeping death. It's going to catch you out. And one day you're going to wake up and become either irrelevant as an organization, or you're going to be finding yourself with the lowest talent pool because all your good people have found a way of going either somewhere else and developing themselves or they've developed themselves and gone and found that new opportunity innovated through themselves. So you're kind of in that circle of doom, really, if you don't. Now, there is a couple of struggles here. If you're in the position as the leader, there's a couple of bits that make this not quite as simple as going, well, I'll just go out and find the people I want and I'll just churn them out. Now, uh, and the first one for me is is understanding the difference between what you need today and what you need tomorrow. Yes. You know, you can't build a team for tomorrow that isn't delivering today. You can't have a team today that isn't capable of getting to tomorrow. You've got to have something that sits between those two positions. And and we'll talk about this in another podcast, but it really comes down to this argument that gets used a lot in organizations. HR people love these kind of things, which is comparing the performance of the individual and the potential of the individual. And they're radically different things. Performance is a today thing. Potential is a tomorrow thing. And and, and I can imagine, well, I, I know, but, you know, having been in, in this situation, that's a really tough um it is a real dichotomy in terms of the way you think about your team because you're going, but they're delivering, but they're delivering. Yeah. Um, and this this need of a, a leader to, to horizon scan and anticipate um, or even, you know, fortune telling sometimes, to be fair. But, <laughs> um, but, but, you know, looking at what does the future hold and also with – organizations very lean these days in terms of how they run the ship it's not like we can have the a team running today's model and the a team of the future ready to step in for when the new model kicks in it's never that easy and straightforward it's really hard to manage the transition it's worse than that because you might have three or four different versions of the future and you don't know which one's going to turn up Ah, now we so we've got A team, B team, C team, and D team. Perhaps. Yeah, and and therefore you're kind of you're hedging your bets all the time, which is again why you come back to the right attitude, the right mindset, the fit of the individual, because if you've got the right people, they will grow into the role. Skills are learnable, you know. Some are more challenging to learn than others, but but with the right mindset, human beings can learn things. If you need them to work in a different way or upskill in a particular area most most of us can put some effort in and do that behavior attitude fit that's yeah it's changeable but that's a much more difficult thing to do than you know learning a new way to code or a new sales process or and you know learning the, a new product to sell or whatever it is you need somebody to learn well for me attitude was always the number one on my list uh, when i was recruiting not least because of the you know the steve jobs quote we did earlier but also you know, you bring people in that are highly skilled, they're often wedded to that um, that skill set. They're often, you know, I know best and, and trying to get them to unlearn in order to adapt and go again in a slightly different way or even a dramatically different way is really hard. And it, it's like you're, you're literally pulling teeth trying to get them to switch. Whereas 
those with an attitude that's you know aligned to where you're going people that bought in they want to be a part of it they go okay well just let's look at how we do this exactly and and there's nothing there's nothing wrong to say you might have some people in a team who are high performing today they're delivering what you want they might be doing exactly what you need they might even be delivering out the you know off the charts type performance today where you consciously know they're not going to be part of the team going forward and that's okay because going forward might be a three five year time frame they might not want to be part of the team over three or five years yeah but there's no point pretending that the person who's delivering out of you know off the charts today with no potential to move forward you know is your big hope for the future if you if you in your heart of heart know they're not moving forward they're not moving forward and then it's about how you manage them and how you you deal with that situation to the point where actually it might be they're fine right now i've had that i've had people in my team i had i remember again going back to to a sales team that i worked in we had a guy and everyone went you know but he's he's got no potential he's got no future and i'm looking at him going he's 62 <laughs> <laughs> He's 62. I'm, there's no way I'm going to have a conversation with him that says, why don't we talk about your long-term plan? His long-term plan was golf. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> you know? I like him already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, well, he's you. Sorry, I didn't. Oh, oh, <laughs> um, oh. But you get what I mean, right? Yeah, in, in, the team, in that sales team, this is a guy who consistently hits his number year in, year out. You know, he's a high-performing person with zero potential. I've got him for three years. What do you do with that? You go, right, what do you need from me? I've got you for three years, hit your number. That's one less person I need to worry about. Correct, yeah. So I think I think that you know, different places in this talent process of understanding where people are. And that's why I think in the next podcast, we'll, we'll look at that performance potential thing in a lot more detail because that's the really interesting thing. Knowing where somebody is in that grid then directs your management actions. And, and, and sometimes the, man action, the management action might be get out of their way, leave them alone. Yes. It's probably, you know, of all the podcasts that we've done, the one I'm probably looking forward to the most is this this helping people to understand this comparative assessment between performance potential and, and how leaders perhaps struggle with with really doing that in the right way for the organization and not necessarily for the individual. How do we get this right in terms of that that future state we're trying to look at? And can we step out of the today in order to look at that future? You've only got two weeks to wait and you're going to find out. Brilliant. Can't wait. Next time on The Question Is. This podcast is really about the kind of nine box grid as a mechanic. What is it? And why do organizations use it um, for those that are not familiar with this? To find out how Thinking Focus can unlock the potential within your organization, go to www.thinkingfocus.com, where you'll discover more about the work we do, helping our clients increase productivity and enable change.